Well, open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Tonight, in our study of zeal, we've spent the last two classes that we've had of this. First one we spent uh, talking about what is zeal. And there's various ways we can describe it, but at the very core of it, it is an all-consuming passion for God. And I made the distinction, I'm going to make it several times throughout this course, that does not necessarily mean ha happy, giddy emotions all the time. Uh, depending on how you're made up and everything, you experience zeal different ways. But zeal is not so much an emotional state as more as a, a style of life and what you have chosen to do. And do you choose daily to live for God or do you not choose daily to live for God? Uh, and the second lesson we were talking about, how do you start that fire? How do you build that fire uh, that will kindle zeal in your life? And it takes the right fuel, the right source. So we talk about the relationship with God, the need to engage in the Word of God, the need to engage with God's people. Uh, you really, well, taking something that's present in our mind, the last year, 2020, I don't know how many people could make it through it if they had, didn't have the church didn't have other Christians lean on support. We had to lean on each other different ways than what we're used to. But we had to lean on each other hard and fast over this last year, and we continue to do so. Um, now tonight, we're kind of dealing with the, we're dealing with the opposite of zeal, which is necessary in our study, and that is looking at lukewarm. Um, I would refer those watching at home and those here. I preached on it, I believe, several months ago. I would go back to the sermon archives it was a lesson entitled, Am I Lukewarm? We talked about in that lesson that lukewarm and zeal is actions. It is habits. It is lifestyle. It isn't necessarily emotion. Because oftentimes when we're in a slump, we can feel like, I'm not doing enough. Or I'm not as zealous as I should be. I'm not doing the things I ought to be doing. And we focus on the negative instead of, looking at, okay, what is the overall pattern of our life? I like to give you an example, and, and uh, I think it was Mark Beans who brought this out a couple weeks ago. Let's look at Elijah. You know, think about Elijah real quick. Really zealous for God. I don't think anyone here is going to deny that Elijah was zealous for God. But he had a point in his life where he becomes so dejected, so depressed, that he goes out to the wilderness after, you know, he's destroyed the prophets of Baal, and he says, Lord, take me now. I'm, I'm done. I, the only one left that's faithful in Israel. And this is the Brendan Ashby oversimplified Bible on this point. But basically, God tells him, go take a nap and go eat a snack. And when you wake up, we'll talk and you'll, you'll feel differently. He needed to have a little bit of a recharge and say, no, you're, you're not the only one left. So I'm doing this long preface just to get it out of the way because I think sometimes when we talk about lukewarmness, we we very easily, myself included, see ourselves, well, I, I'm lukewarm, and that's not always the case. You've got to look at what's your habit of life, what are your actions, what are your passions, what are your priorities. Okay, so starting Revelation chapter 3, it'll be up on the board, verses 15 and 16. He says to the church at Laodicea, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold, hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so you may see. To those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, quick little point here. Jesus, Jesus is not saying, you know, I've often heard it say on hot and cold that you need to be either for God or against God. Like, Jesus just wants you to pick a side. And that's not necessarily what the Bible, what Jesus is talking about here at, to the church at Laodicea. The city of Laodicea sat near a natural hot spring and a natural fresh water spring. The hot springs were known for their restorative and healing properties, and the cold spring was a rest stop on the Silk Road to bring refreshment to weary travelers. And basically what Jesus is saying here is because you, per, you have no use 
You're not hot to provide healing or uh, relief to aching bones or joints. And you're not cold, so you don't bring refreshment either. You're lukewarm. And that's good for nothing. I know in Tucson, you get really thirsty when you're out running errands. And if you happen to leave your water bottle, it's not one of those nice insulated ones. You drink lukewarm water, more than likely it's going to be nasty hot water. It's not refreshing. And that water's not hot enough to really bring any relief to your aches and pains. So lukewarm really is not good for anything. Paul, you had something? Yeah, what, what Jesus is saying here is that you are not distinctive. Right. There's nothing distinguishing you from the world around you. And to Christ, that is disgusting. Right. To, to the same degree that taking a sip of lukewarm coffee is disgusting. Right. Um, not doing anything. And I don't know about you, but because I pay money for my coffee, sometimes I do force down that last lukewarm drop, but it's, it's not great. It's, it's revolting. And that's, you think of a, a, think of a cup of coffee that's been sitting out a couple hours and then trying to drink it. It's, it's not good. And that's why Jesus uses this language of it's revolting. I'm going to spit you out. I'm going to vomit it because it's disgusting to him. Excuse me. So tonight, again, we're going to be looking at a snapshot of a lukewarm Christian. We're going to be talking about how do we avoid this, uh, some discussion on that. Um, now, I like what Mark had to say in this first paragraph here. He said, clearly the Lord who died for us is not at all happy with Christians who are lukewarm. All Christians who want to maintain life, lifelong zeal need from time to time examine themselves. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, examine yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith. Um, and this is not a routine. I, I wouldn't submit to you that this is not a day-to-day, -day, like, scrutinizing microscope examination, but there are times in our lives, in our Christian walk, where we have to kind of sit down and, for lack of a better phrase, have a come-to-Jesus talk, even though we've technically already come. But you know what I'm saying is, you really have to, am I really doing what I ought to be doing? And there's, there's little signs and signals that would key you in on when you need to do that type of self-examination. Steve? Well, when he talks about the spirits that were being led by, uh, I think that's saying that's something that we should do for every action, especially when it involves other brethren or other people. We should determine that what's drawing us into the situation is, is the spirit of that from God and consistent with God's word. And I'm not saying I disagree with you, but I think it should. But I think self. I think the Christian should be someone that is always looking at their behavior and their attitudes, and making sure that they that it's consistent with what the Bible teaches. And should be trying. Part of that is growing in God's word every the day. So I agree with you. Sometimes maybe you need a complete analysis and overhaul. But I think we should be concerned about it all the time. I think we spend way too much time trying to guess what other people are doing and wondering whether they're being right with God and not nearly enough time and thinking about what we're doing and whether we're right with God. Right. And I, I, would, I would concur with that, that there is, a, there is a daily reflection. And maybe I'm splitting hairs here, but I think this is why I'm a big advocate for daily devotionals, your daily worship, your daily contemplate, contemplation of the Word of God. Because as we just got done saying with studying on how to study the Word of God is you are not saying the Word of God accurately and faithfully unless you are reflecting it upon what is it teaching and these questions of am I fulfilling these precepts? Am I in violation of this? Am I embodying this teaching? That I would say is reflection. The type of self-examination that Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians is very specific self-examination because the Corinthian brethren, well, I could spend to the rest of class and all of next week and all of next month, taught, they had a lot of issues that they were deluded about. They thought there was nothing wrong with the immorality in the congregation. They thought there was nothing wrong that some of their brethren were starving. They thought there was nothing wrong that they were bickering and quarreling. And so Paul's really saying there, even in 2 Corinthians, after they've cleaned up their act a little bit, that basically, y'all need to go sit down 
stare into the word, really examine to see whether or not you're actually in the faith. So there's a time and place for both. Um, but again, moving on in this class here. So uh, another quote from Philip Shoemaker here on, on this is page one. Excuse me. Uh, he said, the most deceptive thing about a lukewarm lifestyle is that it looks pretty good at first glance. After all, lukewarm Christians are not devoid of good. The problem is lukewarm Christians can't make the difference in the world around them that God desires them to make. Um, and in addition, Mark adds, we live in a culture that approves of being lukewarm. For many people, as long as you attend services now and again, you're doing better than most. Um, but Jesus warned against that type of spirituality. Uh, your, your comparison is not doing better than most. Your comparison is, are you being transformed by the word of God? Are you, how are you measuring up to what God has taught, what is God has revealed? Paul? with where we are. Right. That's, that's what Christ rebukes the way they say, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I have need of nothing. Right. There, is, there is always room for us to improve. Right. We, we, have, we have been called to an infinite degree of perfection. Right? Right. And that is, that is something that however long we live, we can always improve more in. Right. We, we should always be, as I heard one time, we should always be growing, and the phrase that was used is, if you're, not pro if you're not progressing, you are regressing. There is no plateauing, there is no status quo when it comes to growth. Uh, we know this on a physical level. Uh, males, the human male body grows until about age 25 when it's fully developed. Women, it's, I believe, age 18. I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV, so you do not quote me on that. Um, but once you hit those ages, the growth is done, except maybe in the waistline. After that, the body decay, and it speeds up as you get older. Um, so spiritually speaking, yeah, you might hit a point, and spiritually you can keep growing, but you'll hit a point where you got to make a choice. Are you going to keep growing, or are you going to decay? Because there is no plateauing. Uh, Paul? Scripture deals with that. Uh, Second Peter chapter 1, yes. uh, verse 8, after he has listed the virtues that they need to be adding to, increasing in, he says, if these things are yours and increasing, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right, and Peter definitely talks about an ongoing growth there, and that was Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, where he said, if these qualities about all the Christian virtues, if they are yours and increasing, they render you neither fruit, uh, unfruitful nor useless in the work of the kingdom. Chuck? We go back to the Old Testament. I remember <laughs> what Joshua said to the people before they crossed over. Choose this day who you will serve. Mm -hmm. For me and my house, we will serve God. God did not want a lukewarm people to cross over and take the land that he had promised them. He needed a strong group, and that's what we need to be. Right. God, I, Chuck brings in the, uh, the Israelites getting ready to cross over the land of Canaan. Uh, God wanted a fiery, hot people, not a lukewarm people. And so when they showed lack of faith, lack of zeal, uh, and the, because of disobedience, God said, fine, we're going to take a 40-year detour. Um, they were punished for that. I'm, I'm thinking of... I'm, Maybe I'm mistaking the gospel that is in. I believed it was in Luke, but I don't think it's in Luke. Um, but Chuck's comment made me think of this. You know, Joshua on, on the river there said to the Israelites, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers that you've come out of or the God of Israel. It reminds me of what Jesus said. I believe in the Sermon on the Mount about discipleship. Um... Uh, I'm going to quote it. We're going to play my favorite game. I'm going to quote it. One of you is going to find the reference because it's not coming right in my mind. Where Jesus says, you need to pick up your cross daily and follow after him. For the Israelites, it was a decision they had to make there on the river. And it was arguably a decision they had to make every day. But for the Christian, you have to make that decision every single day. I'm going to pick up my cross this day. I'm going to live zealously for God. Um, so, uh, why would someone? Luke 9, 23. Luke 9 and verse 
23. I want to flip over there so I'm, you don't have to take my paraphrase for it. We can actually do the word of God here. 9 verse 23 of the book of Luke. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We need to get moving on in, in, in the lesson here and, and talking about these things. I want to go over, we may stop and camp on some of these points and look at some scriptures. We may just make some reference to the other points. We'll just go through this lesson. I want to get to the discussion questions here. But the, the bulk of the lesson was a snapshot of a lukewarm Christian. And again, as I've been fond of saying recently in my short time preaching, um, I've seen pretty much all of this. So it doesn't take long for you being a Christian to unfortunately see these symptoms. So a snapshot of a lukewarm Christian. What are the characteristics? Are, uh, so lukewarm believers aren't devoid of love of God. In fact, many of them talk of, of great love of God. But God is not their first love. Makes me think of another church that Jesus wrote to in the book of Revelation about Ephesus. Ephesus was a strong church. But Jesus said, you have left your first love. So go be zealous, repent, and go back to the things you've done at first. Um, and this symptomatically, again, it doesn't, I go to immediately what we see here in the building, because unfortunately this is where we see most of us most of the time. We all can improve, I'll raise my hand twice on this, of encouraging and being with each other outside of the building. You know, that's something we all can improve upon. But I'll go with some of the symptoms we see here. You, you might see a lukewarm Christian show up occasionally in the Bible class, and they'll make some good comments. But if they're not consistent in their study, uh, you'll see them fairly often consistent Sunday morning. But anything beyond that, You'll hear the rationale like, well, Sunday, that's required, but anything beyond that, that that's just extra. Okay, there's some justification there of, of trying to keep your foot in the world, foot with God, or uh, not putting God first. Inevitably, I will, I will say this, that if God isn't first in your life, eventually God will be out of your life. Because God is a jealous God, we know that from the Ten Commandments, but also, if you are putting anything before God, if that does not get addressed quickly, it will be the thing you worship. Now, for today, we're not setting up wooden idols, but I've seen it with, uh, an uh, for example, I, I knew, knew of this one individual early on uh, that they were dog breeders, and they were really pretty dogs, like best in show level dogs. But everything in their life revolved around dog shows and getting there. So when it became show season, I mean, it was like we need a hand of visitors card when they showed up. That, that shouldn't be the case. I read one time, and this is really good, church, we may input the work of God should be your excuse, our excuse for missing everything else. That's what comes first. Um, and, you know, if you haven't been in the habit of doing that, it's hard to put your foot down to begin with. But eventually, people start respecting you on that. I remember early on, uh, friends, family, it's like, well, it wouldn't hurt you to miss a Sunday. In your mind, it wouldn't. For my soul, it would. But you'd be consistent with that. And eventually, I noticed my friends and family started going, they would start making plans Sunday morning. I'm like, nope. Let's do it this afternoon. They start working around. But anyway, I'm going off tangent here. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 here on this point. Um, Matthew 6 and verse 33. See, oftentimes the reason why God comes second to lukewarm Christians' life is because they think they're going to be missing out. Um, there's an acronym now in the social media age called FOMA. Fear of missing out. It's an actual condition. Uh, believe it or not, it's because of the hyper-documented world we live in. But notice what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. But seek first his kingdom 
and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. See, oftentimes the sa Satan will convince the lukewarm that if you don't do this thing now and do God later, then you'll miss out on it. But the truth of the matter is, if you put God first, you'll get everything you need. And I emphasize need. Because there's a big difference between needs and wants. I don't need another Bible. I have 20, at least. What I do need is the message in there. Um, I don't need brand new suits every year. And I don't buy them. I don't, no one think I'm going out and going shopping sprees at Dillard's. Uh, I don't need, you know, fancy cars or whatever. I may want those. may be nice to have the brand new New American Standard with all the fancy footnotes, but I don't need it. So I make that distinction. It's a need distinction because God will give us everything we need, not everything we want. So anyway, but we need to move on from this point. So lukewarm Christians believe that religion is good, an important thing to have, but it shouldn't consume you. It should be in this nice little compartment you take out on Sundays. You might take it out occasionally at you know, family gatherings when you say a prayer or something. But it needs to stay out of sight, out of mind. It's interesting that you don't find Jesus making that argument. I think of when the disciples came, came to him and said, these people are casting out demons, but they're not with us, so we told them to stop. What did Jesus say? He said, right. Right. They're, they're not, if they're with us, don't rebuke them. There is, there is either, you're either all in or you're all out. There is no dipping the toe in the shallow end with Christ. Um, I want to move this on because, again, I, I, I want to stop talking, get you guys talking. Um, they love others in theory, but in practice do very little for others. Uh, doing good to others is often confined to a very few friends, very select few. And they conveniently... Uh, and very convenient opportunities that require very little sacrifice. They do not love their neighbors to the extent that they love themselves. And we want to look at Matthew 22 real quick. Matthew 22, looking in verse 12. We'll read through verse 14. Oh, excuse me. Luke 14, 12 through 14. Sorry about that. Luke 14, 12 through 14. I looked ahead. Luke 12, verses 12 through, sorry, Luke through, Luke 14, 12 through 14. I'm going to pause real quick because I have read that four or five different times and I've read it wrong every single time, sorry. It is Luke Chapter 1 4, semicolon, verses 1 2 through 1 4. I'm just going to read it. Okay. Jesus says here When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind and you'll be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. I remember in grade school, a friend of mine, we, we thought we were so clever that, well, if you, we conspired. He said, I told him, like, if you ask my mom, she has to say yes, and I can come over. And then once I've come over, then you can come over, because I've already been over. And it's this ongoing thing, and we'll just keep on getting to hang out all the time. We thought we were geniuses. And you know, extend this kind of what Jesus is saying. You know, don't invite the people who you expect something back from. Go out of your way to be kind and invite the people who can't repay you. Not because you want to look good, but because you're, in a way, you're being God's blessings to them. 
And so the lukewarm Christian, they, they stop with the first part. You know, you know, Paul and I love talking about translations and stuff. Like, I'll, I'll invite Paul over any time, and we'll just talk about Bible translations all day. And then he'll, I'll come over there, and we'll still talk about it. And we can keep on doing that. We already have the relationship. We get a lot out of it. But where the, and that's what the lukewarm Christian would do. Let's just keep on my click. The lukewarm person would be like, you know what? Paul and I have a good relationship. But we know each other well. I need, to, I need to get to know the Richards. I need to get to know some of the new faces around here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and we're going to get to know each other. And yeah, it might be a little uncomfortable as we don't know each other that well. But we're going to get to know each other. Anyway, moving on here. So lukewarm believers always intend to participate in good deeds someday. But they don't redeem their time or resources or take action. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, it's a, a, the go-to verse for time management. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Paul says, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. I've commented with a few of my friends that it's so rare that I get a night off that I sit down, I'm like, I have all this time to do the things I want to do. And then I blink, and it's 11 o'clock, and I'm like, where'd the time go? It's just, and honestly, I end up wasting my night off, and that's, that's on me. But when it comes to good works, when it comes to zeal, a lot of lukewarm Christians are like, you know what? I, I really want to teach Bible. I want to teach Bible class one day. And then they'll go home that night, like, okay, what's on channel 12? Or I want to read this new book. They, they have the desire without a plan of action, of ever redeeming the time to actually put into practice. As I heard one time, the desire without the plan is just a wish. So you have a desire to do something, well, you need to start taking concrete steps to do it. Otherwise, someday is never going to come, and you'll never be prepared. But there's nothing more terrible to have the desire to want to teach and have the call that says, hey, we need teachers and you're not prepared. And you might think you can wing it. I've seen a lukewarm Christian thought they could wing it, and it became evident to everyone in that room that they maybe spent maybe 10 minutes preparing. Um, it was obvious to me because they were just bringing in other verses that their Bible cross-reference had. By the way, the cross-references can be helpful if you know how to use them. And sometimes the cross-reference might be just because there's a shared word. And it became very abundant that they're bringing stuff that, that has no pertinence to the discussion. Don't be in that situation. I'm going to speed through the rest of these because, again, I keep, this is the third time I've said it. But anyway, um, lukewarm Christians enjoy hearing stories about people who live zealously for God, but the stories never inspire real change or greater zeal in their own lives. It's like... A really gripping drama to them. Oh, I wonder what they're going to do next. Where's, where, where's brother so-and-so going to go, go preaching this year? You know, it might be the same thing. As like, I wonder where Hugh went in China this year. I can't wait to hear about that. And they might just love hearing about his stories of preaching in China and converting people and never letting it serve as inspiration to go out and instead of going off to faraway countries of talking to their neighbor who they know is not a Christian. Uh, lukewarm believers often are silent about their faith. Um, they, they, they set an okay example, but often an example that rises just a little bit above the world. They rarely share the gospel in direct and meaningful conversations. Yes, lifestyle, being a good Christian can accomplish much it can set it can show the world what it looks like but that in and of itself is not sufficient most of the time to convert somebody that lifestyle should be the occasion for why do you why do you do these things you would hope they would ask so you can have the direct conversation or as we were talking about a little while ago you can be more direct 
And you need to be more direct when you're talking to your neighbors about the gospel. Um, lukewarm believers often settle into one-sided religion. They may be very emotional, but without any real biblical understanding, like Paul said in the book of Romans about the Jews. He said they have a zeal for God, but without understanding. We talked about that in a couple lessons ago, how zeal without knowledge is dangerous and harmful because it's not te tempered by the Word of God. Or they may settle on being correct on one particular doctrine and ignore all the other things that Jesus taught. Or more often than not, they'll settle into, I know the right verse to say for this question, and that's it. I, I have my correct answers. Anything beyond that, I'm, I'm not going to do. For example, I heard of a congregation that they had studied through the old Cogdill workbooks, the walking by faith stuff, stuff I never went through, but I know of them. The preacher got there, and uh, it was time for a new course. He said, well, why don't we study, I think it was, it was one of the letters, Galatians, Ephesians. And they said, no, we, th this is the quarter, th this is what we're supposed to study next. And the one member pulled out another Cogdill workbook that had been worn for years, already had all the answers written in it, it turned out this congregation, they just went through the cycle of those workbooks. And that's all they did. So when the preacher finally could get them off that, and they did one, one quarter of a book, actual Bible study, said, what do you guys want to do at the end of it? Hoping that that would have sparked the fire for them to continue in the, studying the Bible. They said, we want to go back to the workbooks. That's one-sided, comfortable, lukewarm, Religion. I already have my answers. I don't want to dig deeper. I don't want to grow. I'm happy. And really, it's, you're not happy. You're actually miserable because you're not actually experiencing a living, breathing relationship with God. I'm actually going to just be quiet now. Um, you've had the lesson. My clicker's not working now. Okay. I talked way too long in this class, so I want you guys to keep me quiet. Um, let's start with this first question. Why is Jesus not impressed by lukewarm believers? Let's just start there. Why is he not impressed with the lukewarm? Lynn? And he's God and he, he deserves our full. I really like that, Lynn. Lynn said that he's given us so much. He's given us all that he is. He deserves nothing less than all that we are in, in service. Why else doesn't Jesus like the lukewarm? Paul? Paul does not to mediocrity, but to a great and terrible transformation. Right? Mm. We, we have been, we've been called not to be a little bit better than everyone around us. We've been called to be perfect. Mm. And any, anything less than that is an insult to the price that Christ paid to buy us. I wish I had perfect memory to recite all that what Paul just said. But the gist of it is, Jesus has called us not to mediocrity, but to awesome and terrifying transformation. So that's what it is. He deserves our absolute best. And he's called us to perfection. In every sense of that word. And we have the grace and the mercy to get there, but he expects our all. Why else doesn't Jesus like to live for? I mean, these have been two really good, good points. Hannah? We have a living God. He gave us a living word and came back from the dead alive. <laughs> and he wants us to be alive in our faith. He doesn't mm -hmm. want us to just exist. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Hannah brought up the fact that we serve a living God who's given us the living, active word of God, who has risen from the dead to purchase us. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm, walking zombies, but living, active people who are on fire for him. So I think of the rich young ruler. He had a good faith on paper, but he lacked life in it. He was not practicing what the law taught fully. And that's what Jesus said he needed to do. Steve? 
about understanding God's word, a lot of times um, it takes effort to understand the context of what the verse is in and what it's teaching. And far too often, it's so much easier just to take somebody's word for it, or you have somebody that's getting ready to teach on it, and they may do all the homework, but they jump over the part where they actually explain how they came to that context and, and that meaning, and it just says, here's what it says, apply it to your own life. Mm -hmm. When you take the scripture that way, you never reach a point of understanding that allows you to truly understand because you say, well, I look at what it's saying here, uh, I'll just take for granted what you're saying because you've done the study and that's not the way to know God. The way to know God is to actually say, who was, who was writing this? Who were they talking to? What were the conditions of it? How does that apply to what the message is being transferred? Because sometimes we take for granted that uh, God's talking to us when we read the Bible. And he isn't. We're reading other people's mail. And so <laughs> we need to take seriously the idea that we need to understand the letter and the way it was written and to who it was written. Because it's not, a, it's not a miracle that we understand. We should be able to pick up the Bible and, and come to that same level of understanding ourselves. Right. Appreciate the comment, Steve. Nancy? Look for people don't usually bring others to the Lord. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Lukewarm people don't usually bring others oh. to the Lord. Yeah, so lukewarm people don't usually bring others to the Lord. And that's one, it's a very good reason why Jesus would not like the lukewarm, because they're not actively expanding the kingdom. In fact, in many ways, the lukewarm hinder the growth of the kingdom. Um, moving on to other parts of this question. In Revelation 3, why do you think that God used such repulsive descriptions of this condition? Why did he say, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Barb? Show how vile he thinks the condition is. Right. He's conveying how repulsive and vile that is to himself. Um, it is like taking a sip of ice cold coffee that at one point was hot. Um, not all of us grit our teeth and go through that. Uh, because it's a very vile experience. Um, okay, I want to move on to the next question here because again, so we may just park here the rest of this class. Um, Unless, did any of you have something you really want to get out on question three or four? Okay. And going forward, just feel free. You have every right to raise your hand and say, like, hey, I really had something to talk about on this question. I don't want to, I don't want to skip over that stuff because I've already talked too long tonight. All right, so question two. And we're just going to camp you the rest of class since we're good with that. What things, people, or cultural influences most distract you with the temptation to dismiss, to dismiss living with zeal and living an average lukewarm life? While you think about that, I'm going to share something from the behind the preacher's door. You know, my big one is that voice say, when I get home and says, you know, you deserve to take a break. You were in the office all day, you were studying all day, you were talking to people all day, you were visiting all day. You deserve to take a break. Uh, and I'm one who, in college, in high school, I would love to sleep until noon, procrastinate, that kind of stuff. So for me, that's, that's one thing that, that's a temptation for me to kind of slide into lukewarmness is I can convince myself I'm doing so much. But really, if I'm going to be honest with myself, I'm like, you're just trying to justify laziness and slipping into lukewarmness. So what things that you all are tempted by? What persons, things, emotions, cultural influences? Chuck, and then Lance. I go back again to the New Old Testament, the first king. God tells us what he was talking to Elijah, that he had 7,000 that had not bowed the knee or kissed the idol. 
God knows who the strong are. And then there was a lot of things going on in the people's lives just like today. Our society is changing, not for the good. And God knows who's going to remain strong and who's not going to remain strong. And that's the ones that is, he wants. Right. Appreciate that, John. Len? I, I, I understand what you're saying, but isn't, but I, I still think you got there's got to be a balance. How do Yes. There is. Okay. There is. Uh, thing, though, is that I've had problems with uh, worrying so much about things that it's messed up my health, messed up my life. I think that's one of the things, not having a I think all of us would agree that we all have stuff in this class we need to work on and stuff. I want well, pre- to say thank you, Lynn, for sharing on that. I know uh, it's not easy sharing when we are struggling with something, and I want, hopefully, that you're all comfortable talking about that among us uh, when, when you're doing this. Because this, is, this class is meant to, we're going to dig in, we're going to find out some things, we're going to discover some things about ourselves so that we can grow and be more zealous. But that's, that's the goal of this class. So any other thoughts here of you know, what, what is a temptation for you to live a lukewarm life? Shame on me. I tried to work and nobody else did, so what did I do? I just went right into the norm. Right. And that can be, that shouldn't have happened, but it is. Well, as we talked about last time, environment has a big thing, big component in our zeal. And oftentimes, you know, oftentimes what we need to do to light that fire again is we need to go someplace else. We need to get a different environment. Um, Kurtz, uh, as fond of saying that his biggest thing for, you know, they would advise young couples, as soon as they get married, you need to move 1,500 to 2,000 miles away from mom and dad. Be on your own and, and figure it out and, and learn really to depend upon each other. Um, but when it comes to zeal, environment is so much of that. And we, we're kind of out of time here. I do want to say thank you for the comments and questions. Um, next week's lesson is a zeal assessment from the book that Mark had modeled this class around. So it should be interesting, should be revealing, kind of seeing where we're at. We're going to talk about the results of that assessment when we come together next week, Sunday evening. We're going to be, again, looking at the biblical principles behind that. Um, I just want to say thank you so much again for your very excellent participation and your comments, your willingness to share. I hope that, again, as I said, you all feel comfortable enough commenting and sharing on this stuff as this class is for you. Um, on that. And I want to say thank you for allowing me to monopolize the time tonight. We don't want to close this hour without at least talking briefly about what does the Bible teach concerning salvation. And maybe, you know, you've, you've been struck tonight. We happen to veer a lot towards evangelism and talking to people. You know, there's a lot of, there's a need for hope right now in the world. And so I want to go to Acts 16. Acts 16, because to me, Acts 16, if you are wondering, it's two birds with one stone. If you're not a Christian, you're wondering, what does the Bible teach about salvation? Well, Acts 16, the whole plan's there. And if you're a Christian and you're like, well, how do I teach them? I don't know all these verses. You don't need to. If you know how to explain Acts 16, you can teach the gospel to somebody. So in Acts 16, looking around, uh, we're going to start in verse 25. The Philippian jailer. It's my favorite conversion account to use with people. So verse 25, this is after Paul and Silas have been imprisoned. It says, But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, 
So the foundations of the uh, prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and, trembled, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and, and after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night, and he washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, uh, rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. What I like about this, if you don't know what the Bible teaches, you have it laid out here in one little paragraph. And if you don't know how to teach somebody, expository teaching is super easy. You just walk a person through, what does it say? So you have the question, the most important question anyone can ask in verse 30. What must I do to be saved? Okay. So Paul then says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. So that's, that's, the, that's the sum of the whole. Paul now explains what does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus? So he spoke the word of the Lord to him. So you, you might have to explain that the word of the Lord here is that Jesus lived a perfect life. He died for you and I and was raised on the third day. So that by believing in him, you can have a relationship with God. I hope that all of us would know those key facts. So he spoke the word to him. And see, we see in verse 33 that that very hour, immediately, they went out to some water. And the jailer, I believe, is showing repentance in that he is washing their wounds. Either wounds that he himself inflicted or wounds that he gave the order to be inflicted. He's showing remorse for his part and their imprisonment. He's showing repentance for that sin. And he was baptized, him and his household. So we see that the essentiality of baptism in salvation. And we see that after he was baptized, you have rejoicing in verse 34. Having, he rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. So we, we have in caps, 31, believe in the Lord. 33, 34, he believed in God. 32 to 33 explains how does one believe in God. So if you've never done that, and you need to be baptized tonight, there is water ready, we can assist you. If you're struggling right now or you need the prayers of the congregation, send it needs confessing, let it be known now, so here we stand and sing the song that has been selected.